Welcome to the Due Diligence Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft. And for more than 10 years with SNN, I've been doing interviews with microcap management teams at investor conferences globally, as well as online. Our SNN Live CEO video interviews are meant to pique interest, and then one can discover more by going to that company website. But personally, I always have more questions I want to ask. On this show, I'll be chatting with public company executives from microcap companies, and we'll dive deeper into companies that are rarely profiled. Microcap traditionally is overlooked, unloved, and absolutely never featured on legacy financial media outlets unless something material is going on that's a good story. With my experience interviewing management teams, having interviewed most of them before, I've built up a network of companies, so there will be no shortage of content. Furthermore, this is an opportunity for me to showcase some of the qualitative lessons I've learned from guests on the Planet Microcap podcast. You can expect high quality interviews with management teams that may have exposure to broader macro trends that you may never have thought of. One of the many reasons why I love the microcap space. So if you love microcaps and especially love learning about companies before the professionals do, let's start our due diligence. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not provided as financial, legal, or any other advice. The information is not investment advice or an offer to buy or sell any securities or make any investment. The views expressed by guest speakers are their own and any reference to third-party products, services, or information does not constitute an endorsement thereof by SNN or its affiliates. SNN expressly disclaims all liability for any individual's use of the information presented in this podcast. My guest on the show today is Sam Klepfish, chairman and CEO of Innovative Food Holdings. It's a publicly traded company. The symbol is IVFH on the OTCQB. IVFH is a leading end-to-end direct-to-consumer e-commerce platform and direct-to-chef platform connecting the world's best artisan food makers with top chefs and Epicurean consumers nationwide. Innovative Food Holdings has presented at all the main microcap events, so you may have heard about this company before. I've known Sam for a long time, and I wanted to invite him on here to dive deeper into IVFH as it exists today and provide an opportunity for Sam to give you his unfettered perspective on the business. So I'm thankful that Sam took the time to speak with me here today in this format. We discussed the company's genesis to this point, as well as IVFH's capital allocation history, specifically regarding their acquisitions, lessons learned from those experiences, and acquisition strategy moving forward, Sam's plan to make IVFH a profitable enterprise, tailwinds for IVFH, and Sam's vision for the company in three to five years, and the inflection points to get them there. With that, please enjoy my conversation with Sam Klepfish, Chairman and CEO of Innovative Food Holdings. Sam, thank you for joining me today. How are you doing? Good. And thank you for having me on. And how are you doing? Listen, I'm, this is a, this, I, I've been looking forward to doing an interview with you, I think for like 10 years now. Uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, I've, <laughs> listen, I've seen, I've seen you present at literally every conference over the last, what, what did I just say? 10 years, you know, uh, you know, I, I know we've always kind of crossed paths and haven't had a chance to really chat on camera and, and get the story and put it out there. So this is a real opportunity for me. So I, I thank you for taking the time. I know you don't do a ton of these anymore, so I, I appreciate it. I, I appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to ask and, uh, gladly, very pleased to be able to talk about IVFH. Very cool. All right. So let's, uh, let's start us off here. The, the first question I always ask everybody that comes on here, that number one question I, I love is, you know, if you had to describe the company in one sentence, how would you describe Innovative Food Holdings? So we're a leading end-to-end, direct-to-consumer and direct-to-chef platform, two platforms that essentially provides high-quality specialty food to chefs and consumers and combine that with an amazing uh, customer experience. Very good. All right. So take us back. Like I said, I've been I've known about the company for a long time. I'm sure folks who are listening in have known about the company for a long time. So can you provide us an overview and history of the company, how you got to where you're at today, and maybe a little bit about what the, the original thesis was for the company when you first got it started? Absolutely. So I joined and I'm sure for many people who are watching, it's, uh, you know, maybe everyone, everyone gets to feel how old they are. So I joined the company 16 or more than 16 years ago. Um, and that's, yeah, and so we were about 12 employees in a small storefront in, in a mall in, uh, in Florida. 
And essentially the business was uh, enabling chefs to have access to a essentially what's known now as endless aisle long tail. I mean, then nobody actually called it that uh, of, of products, essentially offering that to chefs. Uh, the way we offered it is at that time was working with uh, really one big partner and that was with U.S. Foods. And we were able to allow U.S. Foods or chefs of that are customers of U.S. Foods to have access to products they typically would not have access to on the specialty food side. And so it was a business that had at its core, a, a long tail solution and LaSalle, but it wasn't really a platform in that sense. And over the years, uh, several years, we, besides for all the you know, cleanup we needed to do in terms of, it was actually public at the time, again, uh, as small as it was under 6 million. And we both cleaned up the operations, uh, you know, brought in the right people, which of course is key. And we were able to grow that business, not only from, you know, under six million losing money, but also chain turn it into a platform. And it took several years, but we were able to grow it uh, north of you know forty million pre-COVID. This this uh, six months of food service side of business is over twenty five million, and so we were able to grow that part of the business. And so that's sort of the food service story. Uh, in two thousand seventeen, we looked at the market, and we we see you know we had successfully built a uh, this this food service platform. It's doing well. And, but we also saw the importance of the customer relationship and working with the customer directly as well. And so we looked at the, also in terms of e-commerce, where, where food, where, where chefs were going, where consumers were going. And it was clear that the future of transactions was going to be on the e-commerce space as the world became more connected. And so we had a choice, do we buy uh, that platform, so to speak, or do we build it? And so we sort of did both, we acquired uh, I Gourmet and Mouth, it's actually a competitive bidding process, and we built a platform around those properties. And the idea was, you know, that we should be able to reach the customer directly in a way that's efficient and cost effective. At the same time, we added another key part, which was in any platform you have to have the capability to grow. And so we added a facility in uh, Pennsylvania. We were really fortunate, call it lucky, call it fortunate, call it whatever you want, pre-COVID. Uh, and obviously those assets, we, we paid about four and a half million dollars, put in about $2 million into that facility. It's now appraised at north of 16 million, I think. And again, uh, whatever it was that that's, that's a key part of, of the platform is the ability to grow the business by leveraging the different parts of the platform. So where we stand today is we essentially have two really high quality, powerful platforms that do some that, that essentially are doing things related to specialty food, but they reach the markets in different ways. Absolutely. Well, you know, it, it, I, I mean, I remember at that time, I mean, that was around the time that, you know, that direct to consumer delivery of a food, you know, uh, I was one of those consumers that had food, you know, just pre-made or the meals that you can make yourself, you know? So, I mean, you weren't wrong on the trend, right? The trend, that's where the trend was going. How was it trying to figure out how to capitalize on that tailwind? And bringing in those acquisitions and doing all that. So what's interesting is, so you might say to yourself, you know, COVID, wow, it's great. Yeah, you got all these e-commerce sales. I mean, certainly it's terrible for food service. I mean, that's no secret. Anybody knows that. Uh, and however, what well, it's true. You know, we had Aunt, you know Aunt Tilda buying up you know fifty pound bags of flour from in Kansas, wherever it might be, and. Um, uh, you know, people who are not normally customers of iGourmet, uh, the reality is that we had just acquired the facility. We had been delayed building it out because of COVID. I mean, it took us longer than we thought it would. And while it's nice to have all sorts of volume coming into the facility, to the, you know, to the, to essentially the fulfillment center, which was really you know, built, built to spec and to be efficient, it was really hard to essentially Put in the, those platform components that are really important. So, in some ways, in many ways, COVID was really, of course, on a sales perspective, helpful for e-commerce. But the reality is, uh, it, it, it's, it, it delayed the time it took to sort of build out the platform with the repetitiveness that it needs, the measurability that it needs, because we we're just busy filling orders. And so, eventually, that, that that you know deluge of orders slowed down as people realized that in fact, you know, the United States is not going to run out of food, and uh, 
people are going to be able to, you know, <laughs> after they've stocked up what they stocked up, stocked up on. And so, for example, of course, marketing in those days was also different because the intent was there. I mean, you had conversion rates going through the roof. You're going to, people just looking to buy anything that's available. And so we were able to uh, essentially, while COVID certainly took that, made that process take longer, uh, it, now at this point in time and over post COVID, we were able to really, you know, start putting those parts together. And uh, on the back end and the front end, the back end especially, we were able to, you know, we measure everything in a very, very specific way, whether it's steps, whether it's different parts of the business and the fulfillment center coming in, going out. And on the front end, there's opportunities as as the marketing world changes. Essentially, uh, we we are it's it, it, there's a great the, the opportunity to sort of because we own the customer experience as part of the as, as I'll explain later. Uh, there's an opportunity to really focus on spending the marketing in the customer experience area, retention area, which is really uh, unusual in the sense of because of the power of the platform. Absolutely. So, uh, talk to me about the customer acquisition strategy. You know how how are you marketing to the folks that you're looking to get product to? You know, love love to learn more there. Sure. So. At the end of the day, we look at every part of our platform as, of course, accomplishing a specific goal relating to acquiring a customer. But there's also learnings that we would then get for both our own brands and for any other brand that we potentially could plug into the platform. And so as the and as we mentioned in our press release and in our filings, the marketing environment, and I'm sure you've seen other e-commerce companies saying similar things, has changed significantly and uh, especially because of privacy rules, so on and so forth. And we took a lot, especially starting from the beginning of, 20, of 22, we took a really long, harder look at some of our numbers and some of the data. And we're really shifting our resources much more into the customer retention area. The Because at the end of the day, e-commerce, while there's a lot of different moving parts, it really boils down to two things, conversion and traffic. Now. And then, of course, you might say, well, one second, there's this, is that. And the other thing, if you really boil it down, it's actually conversion and traffic. So from a perspective, let's say, of, of, of a, a return customer, uh, well, returning customers are more likely to convert at a certain rate, so on and so forth. So our strategy, especially now, is really we want to make this customer experience, and it's great, but we want to make it even better. We want to make our customers feel like, hey, this is the place we want to buy for whatever reason it might be, and there's many reasons, and that's part of the different testings that we are doing to make sure that our uh, customer retention strategy, our customer experiences continues to just get better and better. And so for us, we've been investing in that area. So for example, if you look at our website now, um, I mean, uh, we're offering now free shipping um, for above a certain amount of dollars for a limited time. The reason we're doing that is actually is to test, to understand what our customers are looking for and what's driving our customer behavior. And those are the types of things, and that's the beauty of e-commerce, to be able to do that. Now, to take it a step further, the learnings we have from this allow us to then leverage that for whether it's our own brands or future brands we put on the platform. That's the power of the platform. Very good. All right, so I wanna take a quick step back so that we can give folks a little bit of context because we went deep right away. I, we can't help ourselves, I'm sure. You know, But but I, I, let's take a quick step back. For those that aren't fully aware of the IBFH story, especially as it exists today, tell us a little bit about you know the full platform, how, it all, how everything works together. Sure. So we have two platforms, essentially, uh, one that's focused more on food service, where we, and that's the, the one that's been around for much longer time, uh, one with the 12 people in the, in the storefront and uh, the one that probably most people know going back many years and uh, that that platform essentially uh, offers thousands of specialty food products directly from the source mainly to chefs across the United States. The, the, the a, lar a large percentage of that platform is reliant on partnerships and what I mean is like so you have these great products, uh, fantastic well, whatever it might be, cheeses and so on and so forth. How do the chefs know about you? How do you reach the chefs? It's an expensive proposition to start marketing directly to chefs across the country. It's doable, but it's expensive. And so at the end of the day, uh, our model in that platform is to partner with others, boardliners, in this case, our largest partner is U.S. Foods, where we essentially power their ability to offer long tail solutions to their, chef, to their customers. So a chef might order from U.S. Foods, the order comes in, and essentially we then have that product delivered either directly to the U.S. Foods customer 
or to whatever the broadliner is customer or sometimes actually into the warehouse of that broadliner. So that's our chef business. And that's the business that has grown significantly over the years. And the oldest one, it, it, it's certainly uh, historically been a very profitable business, uh, given the fact that it requires a lot less infrastructure than certainly a warehouse, a facility, so on and so forth. The e-commerce business, the e-commerce platform, certainly more complex. So again, the, the food service side of the business, the platform took a few years to sort of get get going. And so we're certainly not in any, and from a perspective of timing, it's a similar amount of time. Uh, that allows the ability to, if you have a product, let's say either you're a consumer or you're a small company, and you want like some of these brands behind me on that table, and you want to launch a product directly into the market. Uh, it used to be you might throw up a website and maybe you know throw some marketing on Facebook, so on and so forth. That has changed dramatically. And now it's essentially you need to have a full set of solutions to offer those products, whether it's just your own website, whether it's going on third-party marketplaces like Amazon, Walmart, Kroger, you name it. And so our platform powers that ability to do that. So we have I Gourmet and Mouth that we do with our own, uh, we call them our own online brand retailers. At the same time, it leverages the ability to offer pretty much any food product or non-food, perishable, non-perishable, directly to consumers. So the product gets into our warehouse. Once it hits our warehouse, we have a very sophisticated WMS, uh, actually pretty unique in the industry. And it allows, it essentially can reach pretty much any market, whether it's direct to consumer through different websites or through the third party marketplaces. I mean, certainly maybe a little bit complex, so feel free to ask any questions on on specifics on that. And I was gonna say, I definitely will ask more questions. That is for, that's for sure. <laughs> I, ain't you, I'm letting, I ain't letting you go that quick. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but um, I wanna talk about competitive landscape. You know, uh, can you describe that? You know, who's your closest competition on both sides of the business? I mean, I, I think we can all kind of imagine who they probably are, but you know, just so, to give the lay, more of the lay of the land. In general terms, let's say on the food store side of the business, competition obviously also includes uh, specialty specialty food service providers, so on and so forth, the traditional ones, guys you see local, regional, so on and so forth. And especially as connectivity increases, certainly that type of competition can certainly uh, increase. Uh, at the same time, it provides additional opportunity for us as it becomes easier to work with some of these brands, with many of these brands. Uh, on, on the e-commerce side of things, so from an e-commerce perspective, website alone, iGourmet, Mouth, certainly you have all sorts of competition, uh, whether it's, you know, the Murray's Cheeses of the world or so, so on and so forth. And that certainly is is, is something that uh, we, you know, historically we have really good SEO, on, especially on iGourmet. And historically, that's been our competitors. But what's different in terms of what we're doing is in terms of the platforms that we built, the platform on the e-commerce side, there's there's a few companies that might do some of the things that we do, but there's really very few or possibly no one that does the type of thing that we do from perishable, non-perishable foods, the ability to offer subscriptions, complete end-to-end e-commerce platform. So to give you perspective, again, we're not, I'm not suggesting that we're like quite nearly as big as these guys, but let's say cart.com raised, you know, raised $240 million to do the type of thing, many of the types of things that we do, not focusing on the food space uh, and just perspective. So on, on the e-commerce side, certainly there's competition, the food service side is certainly competition on the platform side. And certainly as it relates to the strategy of how we are using our platform, there's very little competition. And part of the reason we know this is because uh, we also have a B2B uh, offering that, uh, powers other brands and at the same time we know there's based on our just on the interaction we've had with these brands there's very little out there for for your main growth initiatives i mean what when you're when you're thinking about that total addressable market what what is that size what, what's that number look like to you it's a, it involves it involves of course for example you know we like to look at it in several different buckets Let's say that even just the subscription market is one bucket. That's a, that's a significant market. I think over the last few years, 17% and there's a per year. And essentially it's it's a market that because of our infrastructure, we're able to play and we have our own line of subscriptions, uh, monthly subscriptions. We certainly feel we can do a lot more with those as well as um, so that you know, whether it's, and that's also whether it's powering our own or powering others. So that market is, is a significant market. Obviously we're not suggesting that and I think it's a $15 billion market, something like that. I'm not saying we're getting even close to you know, a percent, whatever that number is, but it's a big market. Uh, and especially food market alone is about $170, million, $170 billion market. And at the end of the day, it's growing quickly. Again, both on the food service side, on the e-commerce side, penetration in e-commerce, 
for food is is relatively low. Uh, at the same time, you know, we're not trying we're, we're not trying to offer commodity products online. That's not our goal. Uh, you know, we've seen companies, spoke to companies that have products that are available all across the board and local stores, so on and so forth. And well, it might be interesting. And we've spoken to big brands actually who have that and, and brands we know who started that. And they say, look, we, we just doesn't make sense for us to do e-commerce because it needs to be something that's unique specialty. Um, and so what we do is essentially focus on that specialty food service market. It's a $170 billion market. Again, it's, it's a huge market, very small penetration. And then certainly in general, the CPG brand market is again, a, a significant market. There's a whole sort of, and again, it's a, that's a rabbit trail as to how this happened, but essentially food service, food, excuse me, big food in the United States uh, is, is certainly, as I'm sure you can see in the stores and uh, has changed dramatically. The food infrastructure in the United States and history is something important to look at in general, you know, it was very much built on how AMP built up the the food, the whole industry with supermarkets. And that's also changing. And more and more companies are going more direct and the ability to reach those consumers and the ability to work with these small brands is something that our platform does a really good job. In. So it really trends to all these different, you know, sizable market opportunities. You know, it's pretty interesting because you're, you know, you're hitting on something where like in doing a number of these interviews with microcap companies over the years, you know, the TAM is almost sometimes undescribable or you feel silly saying it because you're like, okay, these are just ridiculous numbers to even say, but you know, it just kind of gives you an example of that, of the opportunity that's out there. And for you, I mean, there's so many different places that you can, put the focus in, but when you're thinking about some of the growth opportunities that are ahead of the company, where, where do you feel that you've been focusing most of the, most of your attention because you really see, okay, if we do it this way, this is where I see this, this aspect of the business going. So certainly on the food service side, which has historically been a strong business for us, we continue to focus on growing that business. It's, it's but it's the opportunity for exponential growth on that food service side certainly is, let's call it as, a lower probability than the than the e-commerce e side of things. On the e-commerce side of things, we feel that as we build out this platform, and again, it's not just me feeling that way. It's it's fascinating. I find whenever I pretty much whenever I speak to someone in the industry, and we've spoken to a lot of people, someone who's dealing with the challenges of getting a product to a consumer or even to a B two B customer, the customer experience managing it is challenging. And then like, oh, well, we work with a, you know, a 3PL and, and I've yet to meet, again, this is not to cast dispersion on any particular 3PL, but it's not, it's a different type of experience. And so really from the opportunity for us is to continue to grow our own brands, obviously, which also continues to help drive the power of the platform, which then also allows us to add, build our own brands, new ones, as well as acquire other brands that really can't necessarily exist outside an ecosystem like like ours because they just don't have the it doesn't make sense from a dollars and cents perspective so it, it's the opportunity is you know continuing to grow the food service business and at the same time continuing to grow our own brands and our own retail our online retailers on our own platform which in turn strengthens the platform and really allows us well, i believe you know certainly opportunities for really exponential growth sam i gotta ask what kept you away from buying into the trend of like oh we're gonna do you know give you all the ingredients, package that all together and just kind of do that model. How often did that come to you? Like, Sam, just do this. This is the trend. Like, you know, look at the valuation for some of these companies that are going nuts doing this. I mean, you had to have some discipline and be like, no, we're not doing that. Look, we own the domain recipeinabox.com. And this goes back for many, many years. Why? Because we looked at the market and like, okay, there's an opportunity to potentially grow, grow a business and um, and uh, really, uh, you know, like you said, the, the parts. And at the end of the day, uh, well, that business is certainly a business that might work again. Although it's, it, the, the economics of it, of the you know, the profitability of it, so to speak, is still yet to be determined. And you know, there are several publicly traded examples. Uh, for us, it's 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 connected. To, all kidding aside, to the fact that we understand how challenging it is to build those types of business. And at the end of the day, we, for example, we did meal kits in during COVID. Now, again, what that meant was we had a a pizza kit that came with dough with with, with dough, excuse me, with flour and a roller and sometimes some sauce. And we essentially packaged it with our sliced cheese and boom, you had a pizza kit. And that was and a quick and that was a quick time where you did that. 
but we still do some of that as well. We still and do some. Product. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, meaning, meaning uh, what we can do is we can take products that come in. Look, we have some products that are under our own label. For example, our cheeses, right? We cut them up. They're I gourmet cheeses. If you go to Amazon, you look at I gourmet cheese. We should be the only seller on Amazon I gourmet cheese. The I, word I gourmet itself is actually trademarked. Not only the logo, the word. And so, uh, so we we take products and put them in different types of sort of permutations, if you call it that. Whether it's a gift basket, whether it's a meal kit, whether it's a subscription. And so it's a type of thing that allow that that are again going back to the platform that allows us to do this. Yeah, we're not going to have as much demand for meal kits now as we had certainly back then, but it's still something that again we're not taking special inventory for that. We, we're managing that we have the cheese. You know, the, the flour has a pretty long shelf life. And so it's just a matter of putting things together, which allows you to have significantly less risk. For sure. Is that so? I'll have to ask on on constructing the platform and putting everything together. What were your biggest pain points over the years that you had to work through to get where you're at today? That's a great question. I would say is is finding the time to, and that's to do with COVID especially, to, to, to you know, whatever you want to call it, walk and chugam, whatever you, expression you want to use. At the same time, the orders are coming in and we're trying to, we would have preferred like to just, hey, let, we need a second. We've moved into the new facility. The challenges are operating a business at the same time, building a business, building the platform and making sure that the, that the customers get the products they need and the customer service. But at the same time, looking at every single part of the business and saying, OK, how can we make this better? How can we make this more repetitive? How can we measure this better? And probably the biggest challenge is um, doing those types of things as you're continuing to operate a business. Absolutely. All right. So we're, I want to ask a couple of capital allocation questions. Um, you know, we talk, we've talked about iGourmet, Mouth.com, and, the, you know, the company is, has grown uh, its business both organically and through acquisitions over the years. So I wanted to talk about some of the acquisitions that the company has completed, including Artisan, Fresh Diet, iGourmet, and Mouth.com. You know, what was, and you've alluded to a little bit, but maybe get the full pictures. What would you say was the company's thesis behind each and any, about on each acquisition and any additional thoughts related to these acquisitions? Sure. So we've done several acquisitions, as you pointed out. Uh, the first one, actually, interestingly enough, a sidetrack. When I when I joined the company, there was actually I don't know how many people know this. There was actually an acquisition in progress uh, of a I won't say the name of a pasta manufacturer uh, doing different character shaped pasta. Now again, without going into the details, we did we did not do that acquisition. So that's the one we one of them we didn't do. Uh, the first one we actually did do was Artisan Specialty Foods. It's been a very successful acquisition for us. Uh, it provided, a, again, we looked at the acquisitions as strategically, like in this case, okay, we were actually buying a number of products from Artisan as part of our food service platform. Uh, we wanted to grab some margin back. We thought it was a good idea to have a facility to leverage further within our food service platform. So we acquired Artisan and it's grown both in terms of the importance it is to our food service platform, as well as it actually services you know, local Chicago based Chicago area restaurants as well. And so that's been a successful acquisition for us. Uh, we've done a few smaller ones, but our, our, the large one that certainly that you know, people I'm sure have, have asked is like fresh diet. Right. And so um, and so we looked look, we looked at we looked at fresh diet as a strategic opportunity uh, because at the time, and still, one of the most most cost, the largest areas of cost relates to shipping, and the ability to do last mile. And they were the largest last mile provider in the United States, or or one of the largest at the time. And so it was not about you know the, that we were interested in getting into the diet business. It was not about that we liked meals. It was more about the repetitiveness of the infrastructure of the logistics that would allow us to then leverage that to again to reach the consumer, but ultimately at the end of the day to also reach chefs. Because and, and so the strategy around that certainly was was you know again other companies later on ended up doing similar acquisitions. I mean, if you look, again, I'm not comparing ourselves to Amazon at all, but I'm just saying if you look at companies like Amazon when they got into the grocery business, uh, it was about that. It was about the repetitiveness of the ability to, to have that infrastructure. Because at the end of the day, uh, shipping logistics is 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 expensive, and if you are going there anyway and you could add on whatever it might be, that makes a difference. So that was the strategy. Ultimately, you know, it didn't work for us. I, again, I would say is, is capital. It's from a fresh diet perspective, uh, look, we we were we were we are a public company. 
you know, we would came close to accessing private equity, but we did not. And ultimately, at the end of the day, that worked against us. Though. So we weren't hitting the traditional, you know, public fundamental investors, mainly there were a few, but mainly not, you know, and then we weren't either really the, the private equity guys, the venture capitalists were like, oh, you know, you guys are public, you know, we're, you know, we're just, and again, ultimately, that meant that the capital pool was significantly smaller, even though there was a you know, decent amount of capital going around in that space. But that was either going to be mainly on the private equity side. And so ultimately, to support that infrastructure, we just didn't have the capital to do it. And so one of the things certainly is that, you know, with the asset heavy, definitely asset heavy type of acquisition. And we've you know, certainly one of the things we've done is stayed away from those types of acquisitions, focus on asset light. Uh, Mouth and I Gourmet, again, we acquired those separately. And uh, essentially the idea was, again, strategically saying, hey, you know, we, we, we feel that look at the market, people can go more direct. Okay, we're not going to own the largest last mile delivery system in the country. It's not happening. Okay, this is a much lower risk much more within the realm of like, okay, you can turn it on, turn it off. You're not feeding five kitchens. And there's a, you know, there's a path to where we need to go with this. And it leverages significantly. Um, and it also had a food service business, which has grown tremendously as well. And so for us, our goal is to, of course, become profitable. But in terms of building a strategy and our platform and the ability to do things in the space and the e-commerce space that really is, is powerful, uh, it's something that we are you know, certainly very comfortable with. Absolutely. And, and I appreciate your candor on that. You know, sometimes it's hard to sometimes own it when, you know, hey, didn't work out, it didn't work out. You know, I, it, but what what would, what else would you say you've learned from this? You know, you touched on that a little bit already, but what would you say you've learned from all these different experiences? And then also, what's the company's current acquisition strategy? Yeah, I would say is probably, again, a few things. But one of them is, well, first, one of the things I did was after Fresh Diet, I think I'm a big believer in this, which is, you know, I, again, I am. I, I'm not a big poster on LinkedIn, but one of my few posts are with COVID, which is, uh, you know, write down the stuff that's important because later on, you know, just remember, it is, you know, how crazy things are, and so you can remember yourself what's really important in life. Again, not not in a similar vein, like after these types of things happen, which obviously, you know, not an easy, not not, not certainly something which is enjoyable, and more importantly, it's certainly something that uh, you know that you know was not a positive thing. You say, okay, what do I learn from this? But it's important to sort of I think it's important at least to sort of do that, you know, really quickly. So you sort of write it down, you look at it, you refer to it back, you know, because remembering five years later, people have a tendency sometimes, four years later, three years later, to sort of things think that that time changes. So from that perspective, I think it's very important, again, people, the data, and then when, it's time, when it came, comes time to follow the data, follow the data, and then make sure you have the right people. And ultimately, it's not about, oh, so then therefore you should go ahead and rip the Band-Aid off because you know what happens when you rip the Band-Aid off? Right. So you have to make sure it's very easy to rip the bandaid off, but you have to rip it off at the right time. And at the same and, and so all those things were things like, OK, you know, that at, at, at that other acquisition, that certainly, you know, was not a positive one for the company. Ultimately, for us, uh, these are the types of things that we could take, you know, learn from and say, OK, let's do this differently. Let's do this, you know, going forward. And I think that, that that has been very helpful. Certainly one of the things that we did right was we made sure that the food service business was as isolated as possible from the fresh diet business and we kept that going really well and I, I'm, it's surprising to me because certainly no one's give, you know I've had people from the industry come over to me and say hey how, how do you guys do that um and again it's it, that's great but at the end of the day we obviously would have preferred that they both would, would have been very successful well look looking ahead you know or, or well sort of you know you put out a, a press release back in in June talking about the company's aggregation strategy so love to learn a little bit more there what what are, what is the strategy? Tell us a little bit more about you know what what you put out there. Sure. So we're really again from a perspective of acquisitions, right? So we've done you mentioned the different acquisitions we did. Now to give you perspective, and let's use this as a I'll use an example to give perspective. Let's say there's a company out there, and and this may even be a real example, but let's say there's a company out there that is doing a couple million in revenues, has a website has a customer base, has good, you know, good CAC, good LTV, everything, but their infrastructure just doesn't support the size of the business, two, $3 million business. Because, and again, it could be bigger too, and we've seen those also, because of the way our platform works, you can take a company like that, plug it into our platform. We can either fulfill for them, but that's not what we want to do. We want to own the company, we want to own the brand. I mean, we certainly fulfill for, we own part of the company, we have small part ownership pieces of some of the companies we fulfill in, fill four at least one uh and then you essentially could 
your, your seat at the table is very different if you have the infrastructure where the, the, the seller, whether it's the investment bank or there's a company itself, is like, we understand the challenges that we face on a daily basis, how you guys can solve those problems. And it's gratifying to hear that, frankly, because I, I, there has not been a conversation that, I, that that comment has not been made. So from my perspective, from our perspective, again, obviously there's still work to do to continue to, again, to improve the platform and you know, really make it further really great for acquisitions. But the, the ability to plug something in is powerful. And that's the feedback we've gotten when we've had a seat at the table. Absolutely. So, you know, another question that I have for you on here, and this is something that I ask everybody when we when they come on the show, is, um, you know, what, what would you say investors still get most confused about when they think about innovative food holdings? And as a kind of a sub question to that, you know, if it's you're not sure what they're confused about, maybe you're frequently asked questions that you get. Yeah, I, I think I think, you know, so, certainly, you know, if you like in the Amazon reviews, right, you, you might get one or two shareholders who are extremely vocal, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the most important question. But certainly overall questions that I've heard is I would say, without knowing for sure, because again, everyone has different perspectives, like people are trying to understand like, okay, why do you guys buy this e commerce business? And, you know, and it's, and it's, it's not about the e commerce business. It's about the platform. It's about the ability to build around that platform and grow it. So obviously our job, and again, I'm happy to have this forum to be able to explain the best I can, uh, is to explain and, and, and certainly articulate what the strategy is. At the end of the day, you know, we you know, could continue to try to do that. Absolutely. If you invite me back. You're, listen, man, it, you're, all, you're all always invited back to talk about what's going on, for sure. Um, oh, thank you. You know, I, I have to also ask, ask this because, you know, I, I've gone on the forums. I see what some people say sometimes about IVFH over the years. And I know the company used to do conference calls. Hey, you know, now you're speaking to me, which is great. You know, but what, what's your what's your thought process on conference calls and, you know, doing those quarterly updates and stuff like that? I think in general, it's a pretty good idea. This is a, is a type of thing that allows investors to get educated. And from the perspective of, Calls, whether it be quarterly calls, again, calls like this, or calls where there's, you know, people asking questions. Certainly, that's something I think at the end of the day uh, does allow the company to really, you know, speak its voice, so to speak. Uh, so, I, again, in the long term, it's something we'd like to do. Uh, something we think it's, it's it's beneficial. We just, you know, haven't that, that we haven't gotten to that point yet. But we certainly, again, I'll say one thing: we are always um, uh, available. Uh, and maybe not necessarily in these forums, but we haven't frankly been asked that many times. So just, just so you should know. And um, uh, but calls, one-on-ones, people, you know, even a bunch of investor calls wants to speak. The only only caveat is like if you're going to speak and just you know be screaming and impolite on the phone and nasty. Okay, that already once, twice, but already like a few times, it's, it's already too much. But overall, if if the investors are professional, we'll talk to anybody. And, you know, I, I welcome anyone who would like to have any questions to feel free to reach out. But ultimately, in, until the time we actually, you know, do conference calls, but we think it's a good idea. Hey, listen, if you don't need to do conference calls. Just come talk to me once a year, twice a year. We'll give the full picture. Like, listen, we'll put it on the calendar already for, for the next six months. But uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> all jokes aside, um, I have another question for you. You know, playing the, you know, look, you mentioned earlier that the company's working towards profitability, near term profitable. You know, the, you just put out your numbers for uh, for Q2 on uh, August 22nd. I have to ask, you know, what is the strategy? What is how how do you make IVFH a profitable enterprise? Well, again, we feel we're on a path, a very good path in terms of, you know, again, if you look at deep into the numbers, if you look at the numbers we put out in the second quarter, uh, if you look at the strategies of of the way we're talking, the way we're focused on marketing, in terms of you know just spend versus sort of retention strategies and the ability to do that with the brands that we have, and frankly the ability to layer on brands, whether our own or additional brands onto the platform, is certainly something that sets us on the path of profitability. In addition, our B two B strategy of powering other brands, you know we 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 are certainly looking to grow that business. We have grown that business. Um, and we think it's an opportunity uh, to continue to uh, leverage our platform. And what's interesting about that business is, you know, we, we the goal is the structure, the idea is we want to power some of these businesses, but we also actually want to own a piece of them. And so in some cases we do. So it's a strategy that we will continue to look at and try to expand. So 
all those things together give us you know a significant opportunity to really continue on that path very good and one more you know devil's advocate type of question for you today um you know in your opinion what what would you say are some of the company's downside risks certainly you know the food service you know certainly food service concentration and things like that uh at the end of the day people i think people we have we've been able to build a really fantastic team and making sure those people stay on committed and excited and at the end of the day it, 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 it as i'm sure you know it's it, it's all about the people and so and from the perspective of that that's certainly a risk and of course we have to execute at the end of the day and so those are the types of things that we want to focus on so from overall let's say you know specific risks is be more food service related and just in general e-commerce execution and just having the right people in place very good i mean is there any headwinds that you perceive or i mean e-commerce buying food online is kind of here to stay at this point buying food online is fascinatingly it went from i remember <laughs> got to be 10 years ago, sitting in a room full of executives of a major, major supermarket chain, and, and, and maybe it was more than 10 years ago, trying to explain to them why she, we should offer a long tail solution for their customers. But I, but I remember sitting there and as explained to them, like, you know, hey, your customer's ordering from anyway, they can order from Amazon, keep them in the family, we'll, we'll offer them the same product and just they won't have to leave your site. And they're like, oh, Amazon's not. Again, this is a true story, and um, we're not worried about Amazon. And, and, and again, maybe it was more than 10 years ago. The point is, every, every naysayer about the food space, as it relates to e-commerce, again, maybe it hasn't grown as fast as pretty much, but it's, it's growing and it's continuing to grow. And people are changing their habits, including chefs. So we think there's significant opportunity in that space. Very good. All right, so now on the other side of the coin, you know, in your opinion, where do you see the company in three to five years? And what would you say are the inflection points that will get you there? I think from a perspective, you know, obviously we'd like to be significantly bigger. We'd like to have built our own brands bigger, whether grown our own brand, grown additional brands, whether it's acquired additional brands, at the same time growing the, the, the overall platform so that it's from a direct to consumer chef perspective. And obviously significantly profitable. I mean, we're looking, we think this, we didn't build this platform. Let's just look historically. Look, we, we built the food service platform. It took a few years, definitely a few years. Look, I said 16 years, I was seven, eight, whatever, whatever years it started growing. Uh, this is actually taking less time. So we think that once it starts hitting the stride, there's significant opportunity uh, to grow this platform and grow the brands on the platform. And so three to five years for us, I mean, we think that the company should be significantly better and significantly profitable. Obviously, we have to execute. But uh, the ability to, to try to grow shareholder value in that, you know, is something we're really excited about. And for me, obviously, that's, that's probably the most important thing as it relates to the value here. Absolutely. And I mean, on the inflection points, I mean, what if you I mean, I don't know. I don't want to say like if you had your crystal ball, but like what would you say are those if you had to look out? to get you to that point where like, okay, now we're ready for these acquisitions. Okay, now we're really starting to see that ramp up in sales on this side of this. You know, what are what 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 are those things that you think might be those tipping points? I think as we continue to improve the platform and continue to improve our marketing efficiencies, you know, we spend a significant amount of time on the back end of the platform. And we're very comfortable as to, you know, where it is today. We're continuing to spend significant amounts of time and effort on really we spent, you know, transforming, so to speak, or making it better, growing the front end of the platform. And as we do that, and it allows us the ability to both grow our business profitably, as well as add on additional uh, brands, I think that's the point where you say, okay, you know what, we have that formula down pat in terms of being able to run the brands profitably. Now we add this brand and this other brand, whether it's our own brand. And I think that's where the opportunity becomes significant. So... I'm gonna, so one question I always ask everybody on here is like how much, if at all, have your shareholders influenced your decision-making process? But I'm gonna, I'm gonna skew it a little differently. How many times have you been pitched? Oh, you should, why don't you just uplist the NASDAQ? Come on, that, that must, you must get that like once a week. Uh, look, I would just say that NASDAQ is certainly a great place to be. And um, uh, you know, it's special, it's interesting. I, I, again, this several years ago, that may not have been as important as it was now, but with the, uh, even with, you know, obviously all the meme stocks going up, going down, all that, but the point is the retail investor. And again, you know, your audience, uh, again, to some extent, obviously you have a very highly educated audience and, but your audience, the greater audience, uh, certainly uh, it's much harder to buy these stocks on the different apps that are out there. 
and from a perspective of practical, you know, you're, you want to go after where your customer is. At the end of the day, your customer, essentially in this case, the investor is not able to buy a lot of these stocks. So you're essentially losing part of your market. So there's no question there's an advantage to being on NASDAQ. And again, uh, certainly, you know, from our perspective, that's an opportunity. Listen, I, I asked it slightly in jest only because, you know, let's you just report 20 million in the last Q2, you know, you kind of you know, got an $80 million run rate, right? Like, uh, you know, for, so I can only imagine, you know, even five years ago, you know, we run in all the same circles. We see, you know, how it is at these conferences. So I, that's so why five I'm asking. Years ago, the data wasn't there necessarily. Sure. NASDAQ. Now it's right. hard to argue with data. There's millions of investors that can't buy OTC stocks because of through apps and they through, you know, do NASDAQ. So then it was like, oh, the institutions are, okay, look, the institutions are not going to probably buy your NASDAQ either if you're whatever that small, but the individual that simply can't do it. So that's a much more compelling argument. Right. Absolutely. All right. I've taken a lot of your time today and I really do appreciate it, but I got one more question for you to close this out here. And I kind of asked this a little bit earlier, but you know, give me the full picture. How would you grade your experience as being a public company CEO? You know, you've been doing it a long time, gone through quite the roller coaster of things and <laughs> through the business. So, you know, what, what's been the experience like for you? It's interesting. Uh, it's a very interesting question. So I think there's two parts to it. Uh, the first part is it's, it's been like, okay, what's it like being a CEO of, you know, of a company that we started under six million, you know, growing it, you know, essentially a startup and obviously enduring a, a number of sets of challenges from day one through the, through today. Um, and then sort of that in itself is really, really hard. And then you sort of combine that with the lens of the public eye, it becomes exceedingly difficult. But again, at the end of the day, Again, I think it's a big, it's important, the emotional intelligence part of it, which is you have to knock out the noise and focus on the goal. And at the same time, you know, obviously there's going to be a lot of noise, uh, whether it's because you're small, you're a startup, because you're a public company. So it's definitely been challenging, but at the same time, you stay focused and try to execute. Absolutely. All right, Sam, I think we're there, man. Where can our audience go and find more information on innovative food holdings? Well, IVFH.com. And, 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 and certainly if people want to buy some really good food, mouth.com and igormay.com. No, you know, there's free shipping now for a short time, I think. Sam, yeah. th th thank you so much for joining me today. I really do appreciate it. Good luck, stay safe, and I really look forward to our next update. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Have a good night. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not provided as financial, legal, or any other advice. The information is not investment advice or an offer to buy or sell any securities or make any investment. The views expressed by guest speakers are their own and any reference to third-party products, services, or information does not constitute an endorsement thereof by SNN or its affiliates. SNN expressly disclaims all liability for any individual's use of the information presented in this podcast.